Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. This is video number nine in our review and response and refutation to the book by Mr. Paul Ellis entitled 8070 and the End of the World. You know, I pointed out to you before, uh, the very title of the book demonstrates that it is based upon a false presupposition. Mr. Ellis assumes that there's going to be an end of the world in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, when in fact the Bible does not pre predict the end of the material creation, and it certainly does not predict the end of the current Christian age. Now, last week I touched on uh, what, what seems to be, in many, many ways, the absolute rock-bottom foundation of Mr. Ellis's book. And that premise, that foundation, <clears throat> is that the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 was not a judgment from God. It was not Christ coming in judgment on the Jews. It was simply the Romans acting in judgment. And Mr. Ellis argues that had, or if AD 70 was the coming of Christ in the judgment of Jerusalem for killing him, that would somehow prove, number one, that Jesus did not bear the sins of the world on the cross. Number two, <clears throat> that rather than being a loving, kind, merciful, and gracious God, it would prove that Jesus was vindictive, hateful, even racist. He used, Mr. Ellis uses that term in his book to suggest that if AD 70 was a judgment from God, that proves that Jesus was a racist. I'll try to get to that in just a moment. Mr. Ellis acknowledges that in the Old Testament, God acted in judgment by using one nation to judge another nation. But he rejects that concept and idea when it comes to Jesus and the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Over and over and over again, <coughs> pardon me, he tells us it would have been unrighteous, it would have been unfair, it would have been vindictive and racist for Jesus to come in judgment of the Jews in AD 70. Well, here's a question for you. Is God a myopic God? Now, here's what I mean by that. Mr. Ellis argues in the book, well, God is love. God is merciful. God is gracious. Therefore, if he judged Israel and destroyed Israel by the means of the Romans in AD 70, then that proves he's not loving, kind, gracious, forgiving. No, that's a totally myopic view of God. I'm reminded of Romans 11, 22 and following where Paul speaks of how Israel of his day was in a state of hearted, uh, hard heartedness, open rebellion against God. And, he's, and he says, Paul does, that God had cast them off. But it was not permanent because the righteous remnant would be saved, i.e., all Israel shall be saved, for the Redeemer shall come out of Zion. But you see, that's only for the obedient. That was only for those who would accept the gospel. And thus Paul said in Romans eleven twenty two, 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. Mr. Ellis strips God of the ability to judge his enemies, saying, hey, look, if God judges his enemies, he's unrighteous, he's vindictive, he's, <coughs> pardon me, he's hateful, he's unloving. Let me read to you <coughs> a few of that kind of quotes and by the way, 
repeatedly, Mr. Ellis claims that the patristic writers who, who blamed the destruction of Jerusalem on God, i.e., because the Jews killed Jesus, he says that the patristic writers got that view from Josephus, who was a Jew who, noth who knew nothing of the righteousness of God, who knew nothing of Jesus' death on the cross. You mean to tell me, Josephus, a Jewish priest did not know of the love of God, did not know of the mercy of God expressed in Psalms 104? You know, that, that, it's an incredible claim. But nonetheless, uh, Mr. Ellis <clears throat> quotes Josephus from Wars, Book 6, Titus resolved to storm the, the temple the next day early in the morning with his whole army and to, and to camp around it about, uh, round about the holy house. But as for that house, the temple, God had for certain long ago doomed it to the fire. And now, pardon me, that fatal day was come, unquote. And so Mr. Ellis says, somewhat sarcastically, the city fell and the temple burned because God was a Roman and he wore a Roman sword. Seditious Jews were dug out of hiding places because they could not hide either from God or from the Romans. Wars, book six. Defenders fled from towers because, quote, they were ejected out of them by God himself. And then Mr. Ellis says, with so much aid from the Lord, it's a wonder that the siege lasted as long as it did. Titus could have sent his legions home, for with God on his side, he barely needed them. Well, look, sarcasm doesn't prove a thing. Ridicule is no evidence of any kind. And it's interesting that he says, had God been at work here, then it, the siege would have wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. Well, I guess Mr. Ellis hasn't read Matthew chapter 24, where describing the siege and the destruction, Jesus himself said, except those days be shortened, even the elect would perish. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, the time has been shortened. Huh. Well, we continue. <clears throat> because I've, I've got a lot to cover here. Mr. Ellis, again, citing Josephus, blaming Josephus for the patristic claim that AD 70 was a judgment from God. He says, connect the dots, and it made perfect sense. Kill the son, you'll anger the father. This was the line taken by Eusebius in the 3rd century, Chrysostom in the 4th, and many who followed their lead. The destruction of Jerusalem was divine vengeance, pure and simple, but although the teaching came from Christians, it root was, its root was undeniably Jewish. The vengeful God was more Josephus than Jesus. And he gives a quote from a, uh, an imaginary preterist, I resent the implication that, my, that I got my Jews from Josephus. Everything I believe is based on the words of Jesus, unquote. Well, I would amen that quote. But Mr. Ellis gives the following. Then how about those words of Jesus? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, John 14, 9. G Josephus never saw the Son, so he never saw the Father. He did not know that God had punished all sin on the cross, so he concluded that God was punishing sin in Jerusalem. It was the wrong conclusion, but one that made sense to a priest up on, raised on the Old Covenant. It also makes sense to some preterists. Well, it makes sense to preterists because the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament, spoke of the imminent coming judgment on Jerusalem as the righteous judgment of God on the unrighteous. But I go on. <clears throat> he says, none of these arguments, that is, that the Jews were unrighteous, God was judging their unrighteousness, etc. None of these arguments is consistent with the gospel. God did not send the Romans 
to deal with the lost sheep of Israel, he sent Jesus. Well, once again, this is totally myopic. He refuses to see that God is, may I use the term, don't misunderstand it, dualistic. God is not only a God of love, God is also a God of justice. God is not, not only a God of mercy, He is a God of wrath. To suggest that AD 70, as an outpouring of God's wrath, would be a violation of the very nature and the character of God is simply myopic. And He tells us that, hey, look, AD 70 couldn't be a judgment of God, uh, an expression of God's wrath, because after all, Paul loved the Thessalonians. Or excuse me, Paul loved the Jews. He said so over and over. Romans 9, Romans 10. Yes, Paul undeniably loved the Jews. But guess what he did? Paul said, and Mr. Ellis on page 113 page 113, acknowledges that, yes, Paul said the Jews were filling up the measure of their sin always. Well, so a question. If Paul, who, by the way, was citing Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, who said that the Jews would fill up the measure of their sin in that generation, then who is sin against? Who was the sin of filling up the measure of of guilt, of shedding the blood of the martyrs, who was that sin against? It was not a sin against the Romans. <clears throat> Do you think the Romans cared if the Jews killed the Christians? No. The sin and the filling up of the measure of sin was not any, a violation of any code of justice, of mercy, of grace, of righteousness against the Romans. It was a violation of God's law. And it was in fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 28 to 30, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 32, and Deuteronomy chapter 32, a prediction of Israel's last days, said, God, not the Romans, God will judge His people. But how did God judge His people? Oh, by the Romans. It was not the Romans in isolation from the righteous judgment of God. <clears throat> and thus... We continue. Uh, let, well, let me read this again from page 113. When he talks about Paul's great love for his brethren, and he says, the Jews weren't criminals, but kin. Then how were they filling up the measure of their sin? If they're not sinners, and I've got to repeat this, who were they sinning against in filling up the measure of their sin? It wasn't the Romans, folks. No way, no shape, no how. <clears throat> so we continue. We go over to page 114. And <clears throat> he says on page 114, I realize I'm going against 2,000 years of church, church tradition, not to mention a couple of badly translated Bibles. But I am 100% certain about this. The image of a vindictive Jew killing God is wholly inconsistent with the gospel of Jesus. It's like saying, number one, the Lamb of God carried the sin of the world, John 1, except the Jews. Jesus is the propitiation for the world's sins, 1 John 2, 2, except for the Jews. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, Isaiah 53, except for the Jews. God condemned all sin at the cross, Romans 8, 3, except for the Jews. God keeps no record of sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, oh, except for the Jews. The Holy Spirit forgives all sin, Hebrews 10, 17, except for the Jews. Love your enemies, except for the Jews. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is, I, I want to be kind, I want to be respectful, but this is an absolutely horrid abuse of the concept of the righteousness and the justice of God. Let me give you an example. The Lamb of God carried the sin of the world, John 1, 29. That's true. For those who accept, accepted and accept. Now, evidently, Mr. Ellis, logically, I don't know if he is theologically, I do not, I haven't found a statement to it of an emphatic position that he is taking, but if Mr. Ellis is going to be consistent with his claim here that Jesus bore the sin of the world, therefore the Jews had no sin to be judged in AD 70, although he, he admits and agrees that the Romans were judging them for their sins. Hello? Talk about inconsistency. But anyway, if Mr. Ellis is going to argue that the Lamb of God carried the sin of the world with him on the cross, thus meaning that the Jews had no sin to be judged for in AD 70, then he is affirming universalism. But the testimony of the scripture is, did Jesus die for the sin of the whole world? Yes, he did. But he died effectively, you know, he died potentially for the whole world. He died effectively only for those who accept the sacrifice. That's why the message was speaking to those who killed Jesus and were therefore in the process of filling up the measure of their sin. And as a result of that, wrath was about to fall on them. Wrath for from whom for what? The wrath of God coming on them for filling up the measure of their sin, their sin against God, not against the Romans. I keep repeating it, but boy, it's critical. So, on the day of Pentecost, Peter accuses that audience of filling up the measure of their sin, of being the ones guilty of killing the Lord himself. He tells them that Jesus died for them, but he calls on them to do what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So what happened if they would not repent and be baptized? Oh, it's real simple. Acts 2.40. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. A citation of Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5. Peter was saying <clears throat> that, the, that the last generation of Israel's last days was his generation and the time in which God would judge his people had come. God will judge his people. Not, in, not independent from, but by means of the Romans. That's why Paul could say that the wrath of God was about to fall on the Judeans. It is why the book of Revelation could speak of the impending judgment of Babylon, the city where the Lord was crucified, and speak of that impending judgment as righteous Righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. The judgment of Babylon was a judgment of God, and it was a righteous judgment from God. Mr. Ellis has simply completely and totally distorted the biblical narrative and has taken a myopic view of Christ pitting grace versus justice, pitting mercy versus wrath. And yet, once again, Paul would say, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. On those who believe goodness, on the, those who do not believe, severity. And he was speaking of the Jews of his day who were about to experience the severity of God in his righteous judgment. Now look, next week will be video number 10 in this series, and I think that will probably be enough. I've promised you that I'm going to be going to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1,
to examine it because he spends a good bit, a good bit of time on it. In the meantime, let me urge you to go to my website, get my book, In Flaming Fire, because this is the passage that Mr. Ellis goes to to try to prove that AD 70 was not a righteous judgment of God. We're going to be talking a good bit more about the wrath of God and about the, the vengeance of God, the days of vengeance from God, and we're going to be talking about the righteous judgment of God that came in AD 70. And you're going to see how utterly opposite Mr. Ellis's book is from the biblical narrative. In the meantime, go to my website, go to my store, order a copy of In Flaming Fire. Did you know that this little book has been used as a book of hermeneutic in college courses? It's incredible. I, I received an email one time from a college professor, and he said, I have never found a more succinct, more powerful, more effective, more logical work on hermeneutic than this little book. So order this book. It's inexpensive and you'll be glad that you ordered it. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this morning's Morning Musings. Listen, you have a fantastic weekend. Please be safe. God bless. I'll see you on Monday.